Well, and certainly you ran into a few challenges as you tried to record the behavior you observed. For one thing, I'm sure the behavior was somewhat unexpected and perhaps maybe a bit dramatic, and so it can be difficult to decide to pull out a pen and paper and record when such things are going on around us. But some other questions we want to ask. Did you see everything? People often say to me, what should I record when I heard something but didn't see it? Or others told me they saw it, but I'm not sure because I didn't. You should record accurately. Record that you heard something, or record that somebody reported it to you. Only record that you saw something if you did in fact see it. Could you record the time of things that were going on and continue watching? Most people find it very difficult to watch the time and to continue watching the behavior that's going on at the same time, particularly when we're engaged in discussion with people because looking at our watches or other timepieces is considered to be uh, an impediment to communication and people may stop talking to us. One of the things that I'm very strict about is that I expect every one of my students when they go out and they work in the profession to wear a timepiece at all times that has a second, clock, second hand on it or digitally records time. But I don't expect them to sit and look at their watch while major behavioral episodes are going on. Instead, a far simpler way to record is to write the time every minute or so and then record what happened in those spaces of time. Oftentimes people feel as though time slows down, and so I commonly hear people saying something lasted 30 seconds, when in the role play it actually only lasted about 10 seconds. So it's important when certain behaviors are occurring regularly or repeatedly, and particularly ones which we know are going to be of significant uh, clinical attention, that we do record those by paying attention to our clock more, more astutely. A cell phone, a watch, on, sorry, a clock on the wall, these are not going to replace having a watch and recording times periodically. Was all of the behavior easy to label? For example, we can have an easy time when a person's hitting or running away, but it's very difficult to label facial expressions or sometimes the odd sounds that people may make. And that's why it's sometimes useful, if you have access to it, to have videotape or photographs or later on to record as best you can, often by talking to your partners, uh, exactly what the name would be for that. Sometimes the simplest way to do this is to give a behavior a label and then somewhere else to find that label. And this speeds up recording quite effectively. For example, I worked with a gentleman who had some significant behavioral and psychological challenges and his behavior was rather elaborate. He would throw himself down onto the ground and he would have basically spasms based on uh, the fact that he was so agitated. He would wrench at his clothing and make loud piercing noises. With his legs flat on the ground, he seemed to be able to make himself have almost a wave of energy go through his body that would lift him six to eight inches off the ground. Well, you could imagine trying to record all that I just said to you repeatedly. Instead, what we did is we simply described it as levitation behavior. Now, the word that we used just happened to be a word that my colleagues and I agreed was a good sort of quick description of what it was. And if any of us read it, we knew what it meant because the definition was someplace else in our recordings. But it wouldn't have mattered terribly if we'd have called it, called it something else, behavior A or um, anything else. So it's really important for us to simply agree on a label and then identify what that label actually means. Were other people distracting? Sometimes it's very important for us to actually control the situation where we're trying to do this observation. And besides, if a person's agitated, the people who are distracting you are probably stimulating that individual. And it's important for us, particularly when we go back to the question about seeing everything, to move to a vantage point where we can really see clearly. Was it easy to keep things objective and specific? And there's no simple way for me to tell you to avoid this. We've been taught to write in an evocative, colorful, descriptive way. So it's kind of a foreign process for us to take out the adjectives and adverbs and simply give quantitative and very physical descriptions of things. How do we fix that? Basically, we fix it by practicing. We need an approach that is focused when we're recording data. And that's so that we don't get distracted by all the things that are less important. And that's why I'm going to show you an adaptation to what we learn in, in, in the first aid. It's called the secondary survey. Now the first part of the secondary survey that I'm going to show you is almost identical to the typical first aid secondary survey. And for those of you who are not brushing up on your first aid recently, um, secondary surveys occur after we're sure 
that a person's life-threatening conditions have been satisfactorily addressed. So this is their breathing, their circulation, um, their airway, and deadly bleeding. If they have any of those circumstances going on, we address those first and only get into a secondary survey when a person is stable. As we approach an individual, if they're yelling and screaming or pacing, we know automatically that their ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation, are present. We might need to check them for serious bleeding, but that is normally done relatively simply. And while we're waiting for advanced care to come, or whether we're waiting for backup, or just giving that person a chance to try and calm down, we can do our secondary survey. And that's going to include finding out the person's symptoms by talking to them and others. What exactly is the person thinking, feeling, and doing? When have these behaviors been happening, thoughts and feelings been happening, and how severe are they? For example, if a person says that they're thinking about suicide, we we'll want to ask exploratory questions, again, open-ended if possible, to get a sense of how they're thinking about suicide. Have they got a plan for suicide? Have they been persevering at trying to do it, and the family is the only reason they haven't? Or has it crossed their mind? A is for alcohol and drugs. That's not normally what the secondary survey calls for, but we're going to use it for alcohol and drugs. Try to find out from the person when and what they have taken and the amount. And again, an open-ended question here is sometimes the best way to do it because we'll create a defensive response if we start with a closed-ended question, just directly asking the person, have you taken any alcohol or drugs? Instead, we can ask this question by not limiting it to illicit substances. We can just ask the person, have you consumed anything or is there any kind of medicine or substance that you may have taken that might be affecting how you're feeling? And medicines themselves should be mentioned as well. And again, not just what people have taken, but what they should be taking. What's their prescription or what are they prescribed? So find out what they've taken, what doses they're supposed to be taking, when, and whether or not they have medications that are taken on what we call a PRN basis. And PRN is Latin for prorenata, pro but what it means in simple terms is taken as needed. So if you take aspirin for a headache, you're taking medication on a PRN basis. But PRN medications can be for anything, from diarrhea to uh, muscle cramps to psychiatric episodes. One of the things I strongly recommend to those of you who are taking the class and who are working closely with mental health consumers is that every three months you work with that individual to create a small um, medication card that they can carry with them. Do it on a simple piece of paper on a computer and then shrink it down in, in terms of its font usually accomplishable on a photocopier, and then go get it laminated. Do it every three months because people's medications quite commonly change. But on that card, list the medications the person takes, the dosages, and the times. And on the back of the card, I would suggest you do things like, for example, identify the person's medical service plan number, their address, perhaps have in their other vital information, such as their allergies. P is for past medical history. Now, if you've taken first aid, Normally, they put allergies up under the A, but we're going to include our allergies here under past medical history. Ask the person what diagnoses they have. We mean both physical and mental diagnoses, as well as what allergies they may have. And we're not just concerned about allergies, such as environmental allergies, but whether, for example, the person is allergic or sensitive to certain medications. For example, I worked with one lady who was a former or recovering addict, and while she wasn't literally allergic to um, opioid medication, she was highly sensitive to it and had learned the hard way that if she was given a painkiller that would contain opioids, it could cause her to relapse into her addiction. Find out about the person's last meal. What did they eat? When did they eat? And how much food? And don't be surprised if for many people, what they ate or when they ate was not very much and, not very, and quite some time ago. Often, people being malnourished or low in blood sugar is a precipitant to a crisis. E is for events. What happened before, during, and after? So that's the ABC we spoke of before. What were the antecedents or events before the person's behavior? And then get a clear sense of the behavior itself during the episode. What was happening? How long? How intense? Who was involved? And what's happened afterwards since you've arrived or even since the person de-escalated? And R is for relatives. So this is any kind of next of kin, perhaps not literally blood relatives, but find out who can meet that person at whatever facility they're going to go to 
or even just who can give you more information. Often those people are the best sources of history and they can also tell you whether or not that individual is very close to their typical persona at that point or whether or not they're very far away. It's valuable, for example, to find out from these people whether or not a threat of suicide is something the person has acted upon before or whether or not it's likely to be something you have some time to manage. So you'll notice that the mnemonic here is sampler. Some of you might be familiar with sample, but I like to add a little value, so we're going to give you sampler. The second type, our second part of our secondary survey is promiser, is the mnemonic. P stands for pulse, and if you're uh, not familiar with how to take a radio pulse, I will attach a video to show you how to do that later on. Now, we must always remember a couple of things. First of all, if in order to take a person's pulse, you're going to agitate them, we don't want to do it. We have to make sure that person has a comfort level with us doing this because we are going to be invading their personal space and actually touching them. And if we're going to aggravate them, then the whole purpose of being there is undermined. Now, when we take a person's pulse or check their vital signs, it's a very important thing for us to come back and check that pulse more than one time and later on describe to BC Ambulance or the personnel we meet at the emergency ward whether or not there was a trend towards the person having their pulse go down whether it was stable or whether it was escalated. And as I said, click on the link for the video and I'll show you how to correctly take a pulse and I'll get you to do it for yourself and on somebody else. By the way, we'll only be doing the radial pulse, which is the pulse taken at the wrist. We won't be taking the pulse on the carotid because that's even more invasive. And frankly, the carotid pulse is not going to be a reliable idea for us of whether or not that person's pulse rate is in the normal realm of 60 to 100 beats per minute. When we're taking a carotid pulse, we're really going to just simply find out if a person has a pulse. That would be the last pulse we would typically lose. We're also going to take a look at a person's respiration rate and quality. We don't need to touch the person to do this as we would in some physical first aid situations, but we can certainly observe the person and just characterize their respirations as being fast or slow, shallow or deep, erratic or regular. And in fact, we can ask the person to assess their own respiration by putting their hand on their diaphragm. And this is a useful biofeedback process that not only helps you to collect data, but also gets the person to monitor their own physiological condition and it can help them to calm down. It's one of many different exceptional tools that we can use around biofeedback. Having people focus on restoring their physical feelings of well-being will often bring them back to an emotional feeling of well-being. Ask a person orienting questions to determine their level of consciousness. And we're really going to be focused on three different levels of consciousness. The first of these is the person being alert and responsive. The second is the person being responsive but confused. And the third is the person not being responsive at all. So for example, if a person is responsive and alert, when asked what day of the week it is, they tell you the correct answer. When responsive and confused, they answer, but yet they answer completely wrong. Uh, perhaps they only make a sound. And if they're not responsive, as the name suggests, they're not doing any kind of verbalization at all. Now, like our pulse, we're going to check our respiration rate and the orientation to surroundings more than once, especially if the person is in a setting where the ambulance is going to be arriving uh, with some delay. So we can do this every three to five minutes and keep a record just on a simple piece of paper indicating how the person was trending. If a person is becoming more and more delirious or psychotic than their orientation to the surroundings, their level of consciousness will remain responsive, will become more and more confused. We also want to check for medic alert for people. So medic alert bracelets have long, long ago become outmoded and there are many other places on a person's body where medic alert information may be located necklaces, watches, even tattoos, wallet cards, and anklets. So ask the person, and if the person loses consciousness or has an altered state of consciousness, and you are able to observe or have a trusted person observe whether or not they have a medical alert um, identification, then do so. Check for injuries and have the person describe to you any injuries they may have, because the injuries may have come secondarily to the mental health crisis, or they might have precipitated the mental health crisis, particularly if the person has a head injury, or if they're in shock in any way. 
S is a substance check. We already asked about alcohol and drugs in the previous part of the secondary survey. But here we're asking people whether or not they have substances with them. What they might have, when, how much, and do they have needles? Are they currently carrying? Now this can present some challenges I recognize for people in law enforcement. But we want to make sure that if possible, we are avoiding getting into confrontations with people about the substances they may have on their bodies, as well, of course, about getting exposed to them, particularly to sharps. And so asking a person questions such as, do you have anything on you that you might want to leave in your home or leave with somebody else that might be um, taken away when we got to a hospital or to some other facility? And if a person is being forthright and open with you, then by all means, especially if you have a strong relationship with them, ask them directly about the substances they use. For example, many addicts will tell you what their drug of choice is and whether or not their choices, whether they've used that drug recently and whether or not they're having a typical reaction. Look for the effects of shock. For example, does a person have pale or flushed skin? Do they have a high temperature or a low temperature? High temperature is not typical. Low temperature is nausea, faintness, thirst, confusion, or denial. So when a person is showing the signs of shock, it's an evidence that they've either been through psychological trauma or physical trauma, or both. And we need to treat the underlying causes of the shock as well as provide warmth, air, and rest for that person. So warm them up. Even if it's hot outside, that person's circulation will be slower and there will therefore be more cool. A is for air, war. Give them some warmth, air, and rest. A is for air. Help that person by giving them open windows and by having others move out of the space and of course oxygen for those of you who have access to that. And R is for rest. Have the person sit, lay down if they're willing to do so, elevate injured areas or even elevate their feet above and that will allow the person to be able to get some rest as well as uh, helping us to avoid that person falling over in the event that we lose consciousness. And finally, R is for responsiveness. So we've talked already about this, asking those questions that uh, look for uh, the person's level of consciousness, but also just does the person respond uh, at all to us. For example, if an individual has used a substance and is unconscious, do they have any form of physical response at all to a pain stimuli, to hearing their name, do they make a noise or move, and again we want to record uh, and, uh, and observe this frequently throughout the interaction so that the person that attends knows whether or not this is a person who is in imminent danger. One last thing before we move on here. I'm often asked why would we need to attend if we're a first responder to mental health or community facilities? Why are we being called there when an individual that works in that setting is probably better trained than we are to deal with the circumstance? The answer is that the people working in those facilities have a very different, different mandate to you and a different skill set. So you want to start by asking why they're calling you. What are they hoping to get from you? For example, I've had to call uh, RCMP and Vancouver Police on many occasions because I knew that the individual I was supporting wasn't safe in their community placement. It was a transient situation, but the individual needed to be transported by police officers under Section 28 to a mental health observation unit just for enough time that they could be brought back to a safe state and perhaps in some cases to have medications or other treatments reviewed by a clinician. Sometimes that taking of the individual to that facility was enough to spur other supports in the days that followed. But we don't want to come in the door and immediately tell people, I can't do anything for you. For example, people working in community group homes are not typically empowered to do the same sort of physical restraints or physical interventions that police officers have been empowered to do. So find out what exactly it is that they're wanting from you and try to work in partnership. Understand that the models of care are very different. There's variations in the capacity and the professional skills of the people that you'll be observing in those settings.